first reading tonight, uh, a rather lengthy one from, Ju from Judges, but it's still in line with the theme that we have chosen for Advent this year of symbols of salvation. When we look at some of those stories from the Old Testament that really do reflect Christ to us today, it's a story found in Judges 6, 6 11 through 24, and then 7 through uh, verses 2 through 9. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, <clears throat> he said, The Lord be with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not our Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, <clears throat> and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down the Midianites, all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat from an epoch of flour. He made the bread without yeast, putting the meat in the basket and its broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Oprah of the Abyssalites. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into your hands, in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took all the men down to the river. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, 
with the 300 men that have lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon <clears throat> sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Our second reading is also from the Old Testament, from Micah chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who, gives, uh, who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers shall return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you <clears throat> for our God who is present with us. And Lord, we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds so that we might receive the message of your word into our heart so that it might make a difference in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The symbols of salvation have been, has been the theme that we have been using uh, during our Advent Wednesday evening services. And what we have done is we have looked at some of the unusual, not unusual, but the less than common Advent themes from the Old Testament, where we look at stories of the story of the burning bush and how that relates to our Savior Jesus. And Pastor Doug talked last week about the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle and how that relates to us. And then on a third night, we are going to talk a bit about Gideon, someone who you don't necessarily associate with Advent too much. But it's a fascinating story. It's a uh, in the story, we see where, once again, God's people needed deliverance. They had gotten themselves through their own sinfulness into another mess, and they began crying out to the Lord to deliver them from their enemies, who were the Midianites. And God chose a most unlikely candidate to be their deliverer, Gideon. Gideon, when God called him, he was actually hiding from the Midianites in fear, threshing his wheat. So when God comes to this man who's afraid of the Midianites, who's sort of doing all that he can to let himself not be seen, God comes to him and calls to him and chooses him, of all people, to be the one who's going to deliver his people. And he went through his whole array of excuses. Well, how can I? How can you possibly expect me to deliver the people? I mean, if you look at me, he said, my clan is the weakest of all of Israel, and he himself is the least in his whole father's house. But nonetheless, God chose him and called him and saw the potential because it was his potential in Gideon. And the angel of the Lord says to this man who was afraid and had all kinds of excuses, 
he goes, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Not necessarily a title I would have given to Gideon, not necessarily a title I would give myself many times. But nonetheless, the Lord looks at him and says, I am with you, mighty warrior. God's, uh, Gideon's response to the angel of the Lord was not a response filled with faith. He said this, and I just read it before, after God calls him and he goes, well, if you are with us, why has all this happened? Where are all the great things that our fathers told us about what you did when you brought them out of Egypt? It seems to me, Lord, that you have forsaken us and given us into the hands of Midian. Not necessarily the response you are looking for from a mighty warrior. But God chooses the weak and the reluctant sometimes to be his vessels to get his work done. In this case, he chose a weak instrument <clears throat> to lead his army. God responded to Gideon's feelings of inadequacies and said, Gideon, I'm with you. And so Gideon finally agreed to start, and he was going to lead God's people, God's army, to overtake the Midianites. Gideon started with an army of 32,000. Now, it's estimated that the Midianites had an army of 135,000. So you have Gideon with 32,000 men going to battle against an army of 135,000 men. And if anything, Gideon was probably looking for more men to add to his army, to have a little recruiting going on to give his army a little bit more strength in his mind. But God comes to Gideon, he goes, Gideon, you have too many men in your army. So God says, this is what I want you to do. Go tell all the 32,000, if you're afraid, you can leave. His army suddenly went from 32,000 to 10,000. And then God comes to Gideon and says again, you still have too many. So he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to separate the ones I tell you, the ones who lap water like a dog, versus those who kneel down to drink and suddenly, Gideon was left with an army of 300 men. And God, in his mind, was going, okay, now we can go to battle. Why did God do that? You see, God wanted to get the glory. And sometimes when, if Gideon's army, if Israel's army were as big and powerful and strong, we'll see in a minute where God said <clears throat> they would want to take the credit for themselves. But it is me who is going to give you the victory. So God took this weak, insignificant man, chose him to lead an army of 300 men against an army, army of 135,000 men, because God does his best work when we are at our weakest. That night, Gideon worshipped the Lord. As he prepared for battle, he and his men worshipped the Lord. He finally was beginning to realize what his source of power was. God used a weak vessel to defeat a great enemy because Gideon and his men trusted in God. 
Now, why do I share that story? Jesus is our Gideon. Jesus is our Gideon. In line with that symbols of salvation, God used the apparent weakness of Jesus to deliver us from sin, death, and the devil. Jesus was the mighty and eternal Son of God, yet he does not appear to be so. He was laid He came to this world and he was laid in a manger, in a cattle trough, in a cattle feeding place. And his birth almost took place secretly. He appeared to be nothing, nothing more than a poor peasant boy. But he was God's mighty man of valor. He was 100% God yet at the same time, 100% man. But his glory seemed to be hidden. And he came to us in poverty and weakness. I'd like to read to you from Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. It's talking about Jesus. And it says, Who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he himself made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. There was a principle that Jesus came to this earth with. He told his disciples on more than one occasion, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. And as he taught his disciples, there is power when we humble ourselves before God, because when you humble yourself, Jesus taught and showed that God does exalt you in his way and his time. God used one man, Gideon, to defeat the spiritual enemies. God used one man, Jesus Christ, to bring us victory through his death on the cross. And just like Gideon, the night before Gideon's battle, Gideon went and he built, and and he, he had a time of worship unto his Lord. Remember what Jesus did the night before his battle? He had a time of worship with his disciples. And he worshiped his father. There are times today that I feel like Gideon. Not the mighty warrior part, but I feel like that weak messenger, that weak vessel. I have those moments when I feel that way. And I'm sure you have your moments when you feel that way too. Maybe when there's, you're in, enduring hardship and affliction, you begin to question, where is God? I know you say you're with us, but where are you? Just like Gideon was saying to him. If you are really with us, God, then why are all of these things happening to us? If Emmanuel means God with us, where are you? Where are you in the midst of the sick and the suffering? And sometimes I'm sure that if you don't ask those questions, you know some people who do. It's just natural. Where is the power of God we hear about in the Bible? The key to accomplishing an an impossible task for the Lord is just humbling ourselves before him, worshiping him, and walking in his presence, knowing he is with us. 
During this Advent season, we look to Jesus as our Gideon, who might be hidden in his loneliness in that story, but God uses the weak to display his power. I love this section where Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 31, he says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may, mo may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And you know, Paul would later tell the story of his own thorn in the flesh and how three times he begged God to take away this agony he was dealing with. And finally, the Lord said to Paul, Jesus said to Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. That's why Paul said later on, when I learn that, when I boast now, I boast in my weakness. Because when I am weak, that's when God's strength is the strongest. When Gideon's army was at its weakest, God's strength was at its greatest. God is with us, mighty warriors. And his name is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And God says to us and encourages us this evening that I am with you. And even if you may feel weak and insignificant tonight, we just read where you're in a good place. Because God chose the lowly things. God chose the weak things to display his power in this world. That's why he sent Jesus into this world in such a lowly, humble way to be born in a manger because he was going to display his power through that symbol of salvation. If you remember the night before Gideon's battle, he worshiped the Lord. There's something he did that same night too. It says that Gideon built an altar to the Lord and he gave a name to that altar. And the name he named that altar was Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. Not hard to recognize the significance of Jesus. He is Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. And he came not only to give us peace, he is our peace. So in your weakness, in your weakness, my friend, may God display his power. That's what he did in Jesus when he was born in Bethlehem, the smallest and weakest of all the towns. God chose to display, put his power on display in weak places. Lord, we thank you. Because there are many times we just feel weak. 
And Lord, you have a call on our lives. We know you are with us. But sometimes, like Gideon, we have our excuses. Thank you, Lord, that you are patient with us. We thank you for a Savior who humbled himself so that he might be exalted and that we might be the recipients of forgiveness and life and eternal life in Jesus' name.